Well, the principles are still the same, but you know, the more people you have in the net, the more you obviously dilute the information that uh, you can get across to them. And probably if you're coaching in a net with say six people, you've got one guy batting and the other guy's bowling or whatever, I think you've pre pretty much got to chat to those people and have a bit of feedback discussion with them once they've come out from batting. You know, because the one thing you don't want to do is to keep um, interrupting the net because you're not going to get a flow, you're not, you're not going to get a seamless sort of transition from one player to the other and it's unlikely that uh, you, know, you can impart your knowledge. I mean, if you're in a single net scenario where you could, like outside and you can get around the side of the net, maybe you can go and speak to the batsman a little bit um, when he's playing and facing the bowlers, obviously. I'm not a believer in too much information trying to feed into a player at any one time. I think the trick is that, you know, you try and agree with the player that you're going to work on one or two things and you stick to those things. And until, um, I wouldn't like to use the word cracked it or got it perfect, but once you're, you're satisfied that you've made improvements there or whatever, you might move on to another thing. I think it's a big mistake to try and attack a player in, in as much of four or five different points all at one time. Too complicated. And scoring runs in particular is about keeping it simple, keeping the mind clear, focusing on one thing maybe in between balls as we discussed, and when you step in, you concentrate on the ball. The more complicated your thoughts are, the worse it's going to be. You know, you can't build and compose an innings, obviously, but you've got to try and work on those concentration skills, how you step in and face the ball, what you think about in between balls. Obviously, in a net session with, say, six other people and they've got maybe four or five people bowling, um, preferably, I would say, um, I wouldn't want six people bowling in a net. Three would be the maximum because it gives the, the, the batsman just a little bit more time in between balls to compose his thoughts. You don't want a conveyor belt sort of system, really. You'd rather have a little bit more quality. So preferably, uh, the, the less bowlers, the better, if you see what I mean. Um, but you've got to try and work on those disciplines of how you, how you address each ball. You, you, you break it down into single balls. You deal with that ball, draw a line under it, as we've discussed before, and then move on to the next ball. Obviously, because that is the principle you want to use going through your, your whole innings. It shouldn't really change. So you can do it for a short period of time as well. I'm not in favour of someone batting in a net for, say, an hour, an hour and a half. I think, you know, if you're doing half an hour, 40 minutes, depending on how many bowlers are bowling or whether someone's throwing to you, um, shorter sessions and more often is more desirable than one long session because your concentration span might not be quite as good. If you're in a net, you're getting a lot more balls than you would in the middle. In the middle, you'd be getting breaks, obviously, when you're not facing. So you're getting a much, concentrate, much more concentrated uh, practice when, when someone's throwing to you or you've got bowlers for that length of time. So I'm not in favour of too long. I think you've got to pitch it somewhere between 30 minutes, 45 minutes is quite an ideal time if you're going to have a longer net. You want quality, not quantity. I think to be a good, you know, a good coach is not just about what we call tell, it's about you just imparting information all the time. You've got to somehow build a relationship if you can, and you've got to get it going two ways. You want the, the, the performer's information as well as you giving him or her your advice. So you've got to get an interaction, an engagement between the two of you. And one of the other massive rules, if you ask me, is you must always be identifying what the performer does well, as also, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna be saying, well, we need to look at this and these, these might need an improvement, we need to work on this. You must also build them up as well, what they do well. It's not all about, not criticism, but you know, this is not right and that's not right. That's not good coaching.
you've got to identify the things they do well. You want to agree with them of what you're going to work on, okay? Not too complicated, not too extravagant of asking too many things, whether it's moving your feet, whether it's keeping your head in line, hitting the ball straight, you know, playing against spin, using your feet, practicing the sweep shot, whatever discipline it is, you need to agree it with that player and then work on that, you know. Um, it depends what resources you've got available. If you've got bowlers, you've got a bit more scope. If you're just throwing, it's going to be a bit more drill orientated and you work on your technique. So it's technique and the concentration. But it's good, as I say, to engage with your performer and to agree with them what's important for them. Because if you're getting a two-way conversation, you're more likely to make progress, in my opinion. Um, you need that performer on receive, is a, is, a, is a phrase I've used before. You need them to be asking you, the coach, the mentor, the advisor. You need them to be asking you the questions. What do you think I should do? Not you just telling them all the time. Well, that, to me, the, the side arm would win every day because the bowling machine is good if you want to pr uh, practice and develop a particular shot, i.e. you're not getting enough range on your front foot movement. So you can program the bowling machine to deliver the ball in the same place every time. The massive uh, fundamental drawback to a bowling machine is it does not replicate the uh, coil release of the bowler where you see him get into position, you see his arm go back, you see the ball and the hand come over and the ball come out. With a bowling machine, the ball just appears. And it makes, in my opinion, it makes it difficult because not every batsman has a trigger movement, but a lot of them do. And, it, and the trigger movement, whether you're doing a forward press, whether you're moving back and across, whether you're just shuffling, it's all about rhythm. You're getting your rhythm right to face up to the ball. Now, when the ball just appears out of a bowling machine, it's quite difficult to get that rhythm. You are really guessing when it's going to come out. Where the sidearm scores over that is the thrower or the coach, who, if, if, he, if he's providing the, the supply of balls, can walk up the action of throwing with a sidearm is very similar to a bowling action so you can see the arm coming over and you can make your setup accordingly and often when things go wrong with players it's not always the trigger movement or the movement that's wrong it's the timing of the movement that's wrong if the timing's out everything's generally out of sync so i think the sidearm um, is, is, a, is a better tool or someone throwing the ball is a better tool. Uh, probably if you can use a bit of everything, someone throwing, someone bowling, someone using a sidearm, a bit of bowling machine, that's the best way forward. Not one of everything.